a school under siege. And the school is in a panic. Two students launch a deadly assault on Columbine High. Oh, God. Stay on the line of battle. Hey, kids, just stay down. The whole time, I just pretended to be dead. It is the worst school shooting in American history. There were a total of 15 bodies. There were 11 males and uh, four females. As families grieve, there are questions about the rage. I'm going to pull out shotgun and blow your damn head off that drove these young men to murder i'll rip off your head and whether warning signs were missed when you start putting all these pieces together to the puzzle then you're saying boy there's a red flag the questions and answers the story behind the columbine massacre next on the final report April 20th, 1999, Jefferson County, Colorado, 11.10 a.m. It is a typical morning at Columbine High. About 2,000 students attend school here, near the affluent Denver suburb of Littleton. 16-year-old sophomore Marjorie Lindholm is about to take a science test. It's an average morning. Everything was fine. I had a big test I was kind of nervous about, and I was supposed to kind of meet a boy that day who I had a crush on. Some students are headed for lunch. This footage from a camera that monitors lunchtime activities shows the cafeteria slowly filling up. Within minutes, there will be 500 people in this room. 11.14 a.m. No one notices when someone leaves two duffel bags on the floor of the cafeteria. 11.19 a.m. Outside the school's west entrance, 17-year-old Richard Castaldo is eating lunch with 17-year-old Rachel Scott. As they talk, a pipe bomb lands a few feet from where they sit. I didn't really realize it was supposed to be a bomb at first. I kind of thought it was like a thing of fireworks or something like that. It didn't, it didn't do anything at all. I didn't really think much of it. Then about 60 feet away, Castaldo sees two male teenagers. They are dressed in long black trench coats. Without warning, they pull weapons from under their coats. One has a rifle and a sawed-off shotgun. The other has a sawed-off shotgun and a semi-automatic handgun. Their actions raise the first of many questions to be investigated by the final report. How were teenagers able to get weapons like these? And then they just, you know, started shooting. And I, I didn't really have any time to react at all, you know. They shoot Castaldo's friend, Rachel Scott, four times. She dies instantly. Castaldo is shot eight times. The bullets shatter two vertebrae. He begins to lose feeling in his legs. I felt my, you know, my feet going numb and my legs going numb kind of seemed like it was going from, like, the top up. Who are the gunmen? While Castaldo lies motionless in the grass, three students walk out of a cafeteria door. One of the gunmen aims and fires. He hits all three. The pair then shoots two more students as they run for cover. How did the gunmen learn to shoot with such accuracy? Inside the classrooms, students begin to realize what is happening. We were taking the test, and then we heard what we thought were rocks being thrown against the window. And then we heard a bunch of screaming. In the main office, a secretary alerts Principal Frank DeAngelis. And my secretary uh, ran into my office and said that there had been gunshots fired. And so I ran out of my office into the hallway 11.23 a.m. A student from Columbine calls 911. Someone's shooting a gun out here and someone got shot, I think. Okay. Can you see anything going on over there? No, someone, some girl's on the ground saying she's paralyzed and I think she's hurt. Police issue a citywide call for help. 1,000 officers in the area race toward the school. The gunmen now turn and head toward this entrance. 
as they do, they fire shots into the school and litter their path with pipe bombs. Where did the gunmen get these bombs? Just inside the west entrance is teacher Patty Nielsen. She recognizes the approaching gunmen as Columbine students. Immediately, she turns and runs toward the library. 11.24 a.m. A Jefferson County Sheriff's deputy is first on the scene. He exchanges gunfire with one of the shooters, but no one is hit. School principal Frank DeAngelis is standing at the opposite end of the hall as the two enter the school. That's where I saw the gunman enter, and that's where the shots were being fired, and then the glass was breaking behind me. On the lower level of the school, the cafeteria camera shows 42-year-old teacher Dave Sanders warning students to get out. Some escape up a nearby staircase. Upstairs, 17-year-old Patrick Ireland and two friends are in the library. We're just hanging out, and all of a sudden, a teacher ran in to the library, uh, screaming and yelling, saying there's two kids with guns out in the hallway. 11.25 a.m. Teacher Patty Nielsen reaches the library. She grabs the phone and dials 911. I'm a teacher at Columbine High School. There is a student here with a gun. And the school is in a panic. And I'm in the library. I've got students down under the table, kids. Heads under the table. We need police here. Okay. By now, the gunmen are inside the main hallway. Teacher Dave Sanders, who has just made his way up from the cafeteria, is at the end of the hall. They see Sanders and fire. He falls to the floor. Sanders is dragged into a nearby classroom, where a group of terrified students is hiding. One of those students is 16-year-old Marjorie Lindholm. Two teachers helped him into the room. He had one arm over each, and they, he half walked and half was dragged in. Um, and he just kind of collapsed. He had been shot twice, um, and he had been bleeding very, very badly. 11.29 a.m. The gunmen enter the library. 52 students, two teachers, and two library workers are hiding under tables. Among them is 16-year-old Craig Scott, the younger brother of Rachel Scott, who was shot and killed near the west entrance. Immediately, they were shooting off their guns, and they were yelling at everybody in the room. One of them said to the other, get anybody with a white hat on. And a lot of jocks wore white baseball caps, and I was wearing one. And so I took it off, and I put it underneath my shirt. For the next seven minutes, the two walked through the library, shooting students. Their methodical actions raised the question. What is their plan? Patrick Ireland is with two friends, hiding under a table in the corner of the library. When we got to our section, we all had our heads down, in between our knees, basically. One gunman fires his shotgun, hitting Patrick's friend in the knee. As Patrick reaches over to assist him, his head momentarily appears from beneath the table. And that's when I got shot. Um, I got shot twice in the head and once in the foot. Patrick loses consciousness. Craig Scott is under another table with two friends, 18-year-old Isaiah Scholes and 16-year-old Matt Kector. After a little while, they came over and they saw my friend Isaiah, and they began to make fun of him for being black. And then they shot Isaiah, and then they shot Matt, and... The whole time, I just um, just pretended to be dead. 11.36 a.m. The gunmen exit the library and head down the hall toward the science classroom. Minutes later, about 30 students escape through an emergency exit door. Soon, an army of law enforcement will descend on Columbine. They will try to stop the rampage and help rescue students who are still pinned down. That's coming up, and later, the answers to our questions on The Final Report.
April 20th, 1999. 11.40 a.m. Police and emergency personnel from five counties are racing to Columbine High School. Jefferson County is getting shots fired at officers. Two males in trench coats have shotguns and possible grenades. Among the responding officers is Dan Delmonico, a member of the Denver Police Department SWAT team. The information coming in over the radio is alarming. It was a military type assault on the school, uh, that they may have uh, explosives and uh, automatic weapons. As police arrive, the gunmen make their way to the cafeteria. 11.44 a.m. This video shows one gunman firing a weapon at the duffel bags he and his partner left earlier. Eventually, one ignites, starting a fire. The fire activates the sprinklers and a fire alarm a few minutes later. Students who had been hiding under tables now run for their lives. Outside, a student gives police an important piece of information. He recognized one of the shooters as a Columbine senior, 18-year-old Eric Harris. At the DA's office, a computer check reveals that Eric Harris has a police record. His file contains the name of 17-year-old Dylan Klebold, also a Columbine senior. The pair had been arrested for breaking into a van. I took one of my chief deputies and we got in my car and we drove to Columbine High School. And I actually went with identifying information for um, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. Students who escaped now confirm that Dylan is the second gunman. 12.02 p.m. Outside the school, police hear gunfire coming from the library. On the east side of the building, SWAT officers divide into teams. They plan to enter the school at various locations and move toward the gunfire. In an active shooter situation, you go to the noise, you go to the shooter, you, you neutralize them whatever way you have to, and it's over. 12.06 p.m. A SWAT team enters the east side of the building. Another SWAT team makes its way to the west side of the school. They move slowly, using a fire truck as a shield. 12.34 p.m. Outside near the west entrance, police rescue 17-year-old Richard Castaldo. Castaldo has been lying in the grass for more than an hour after being shot eight times. And it just took me over to like a fire truck there too or something, I remember. Well, I mean, I guess I knew I was okay then, you know, that I, could, I was actually gonna, you know, I was actually gonna live at that point. 1.09 p.m. A SWAT team enters the school through a ground floor window near the cafeteria. We were standing in about a foot deep of water and the noise of the fire alarm continuously going on. It was very loud. It was tough to communicate with the officers. Police find roughly 30 students hiding in the school kitchen. They rush the teens out the same ground floor window they'd entered. But police order the students to keep their hands on their heads. They frisk them before allowing them to leave. We'd gotten information that the, the suspects were changing clothes and trying to blend in with the students. That's why you see the kids with their hands on the head, because we don't know who we have. 1.45 p.m. In the science classroom, teacher Dave Sanders clings to life. Students post a sign in the window. Marjorie Lindholm can't believe help hasn't arrived. It's already been two hours. I wondered what was taking so long because the 911 operator made it sound like they were around the corner every time we asked, where are they? Why does it take so long for help to arrive? As SWAT teams slowly move through the school, they find hundreds of students and teachers barricaded inside classrooms. As you moved into hallways, you would find locked doors as we would breach these doors and enter these rooms and you found people hiding. Uh, when we would come across them, yeah, it would take us a little bit of time to convince them that, no, we're not the bad guys, we're the, we're the cops. After being escorted to safety, 
many students reunite with their parents at a nearby elementary school. Students tell reporters about the horrifying moments when they came face to face with the shooters. Everyone around me got shot and I begged him for 10 minutes not to shoot me. And he just put the gun in my face and started laughing saying that it was all because people were mean to him last year. Did the gunman target specific students? 2.38 p.m. In the library, junior Patrick Ireland regains consciousness after being shot twice in the head three hours earlier. I didn't know if they were still in the library or still in the school or if there were more of them coming. But I knew I had to get out. Patrick tries to stand up, but he can't. My whole right side of my body was completely paralyzed. So I ended up rolling over onto my back and pushing myself with my, with my good leg, my left leg, on the floor, weaving through tables and chairs and ultimately um, getting over to the window. A SWAT team on the ground sees Patrick and moves in to help. Still bleeding profusely, Patrick plunges headfirst out a second-story library window and into the arms of police. 2.42 p.m. After securing nearly the entire school, police finally reach the science room, where students are waiting with teacher Dave Sanders, who was shot three hours earlier. Denver SWAT officer Dan Delmonico tells the final report, getting there wasn't easy. We had no maps, we had no direction of the place, and as we started moving, uh, we had nobody telling us, okay, the science room, if you're here, go there. While SWAT officers wait for paramedics to be escorted into the building along a secured path, Sanders dies of his wounds. 3.22 p.m. Almost an hour later, police finally reach the library. Here, they make the most horrifying discovery of all. Denver officer Tom McKibben is among the first to arrive. You see a lot of gru gruesome deaths, but never, you know, in that magnitude. You'd see kids laying face down, some of them on top of each other, next to each other. Then, police find the bodies of Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. There is no doubt they are the gunmen. They are fully armed, surrounded by guns and explosives. They died of self-inflicted gunshot wounds. Did they intend to commit suicide all along? The investigation and the answers to all our questions are next when the final report continues. April 20th, 1999. The rampage of Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold at Columbine High School is over. Students are in shock. I was under a table. People were getting shot all around me. They got automatic weapons, sawed off shotguns, and pipe bombs. The dead include 12 students, four females and eight males one teacher and the two gunmen. Throughout the school, police find pipe bombs and shell casings, evidence left behind in the worst school shooting in American history. The level of violence leaves police and school officials wondering, did the teachers at Columbine notice any warning signs? That night at Eric and Dylan's homes, police discover a wealth of evidence, including ammunition, metal pipes, fuses, violin essays, and journals. They also seize a series of home videos made by Eric and Dylan in the months before the massacre. Bad. <laughs> no, no, no. Joe, hey, what's going on, dude? This is Dylan. Investigators question the parents and begin to consider whether they should be held accountable for their children's actions. What did their parents know? 
In the days following the shooting, impromptu memorials appear around the school. For the grief-stricken community, the most troubling question remains. Why did Eric and Dylan go on their murderous rampage? Police begin their investigation by scrutinizing the evidence seized from Eric and Dylan's homes. These items help provide the final report with answers to many questions. But the most pressing is, who were the gunmen? Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold seem to be normal, if occasionally troubled, teenagers. Journalist Dave Cullen investigated the shooting for the online publication Slate.com. He believes reports that painted Eric and Dylan as misfits were incorrect. It's a complete myth that they were outcasts. They had a huge group of friends. They went to Friday night, uh, rock and bowl. Dylan went to the prom. Eric had lots of dates. Eric and Dylan both worked at this local pizzeria and played video games together. Columbine High School principal Frank DeAngelis tells the final report that Eric and Dylan did well in school. They were very adept at using the computers. Uh, they were in a video production class. Eric was in some of our upper level classes. They were good students. After the shootings, news reports that claimed Eric and Dylan were outcasts also said they were taking revenge against school bullies and were members of a so-called trench coat mafia. While there had been a group of students in Columbine High who called themselves the trench coat mafia, Eric and Dylan weren't members. However, in this disturbing video, the pair did portray themselves as assassins in black trench coats. Do not even screw with that little kid. If you do, I'll rip off your head. The video, made for a class project, is based on an essay by Eric entitled Trench Coat Mafia, Hitmen for Hire. I don't care what you say. If you ever touch him again, I will freaking kill you. FBI Special Agent Dwayne Fusilier says Eric and Dylan wore trench coats during the attack out of necessity. The only reason they had these long coats on was so that both of them could carry a shotgun on a sling and a 9mm carbine on a sling without being seen. Of the two, Dylan Klebold, who had an explosive temper, seemed more likely to get into trouble. When Dylan got mad, you would hear about it, he would just erupt. He just went ballistic. Dylan was known to swear at teachers and fight with his boss at the pizzeria. One of Dylan's oldest friends was Brooks Brown. Brooks' parents, Randy and Judy Brown, say Dylan spent a lot of time at their home when the boys were younger. Dylan was the shyest child I'd ever met. When he would come over here, every time he'd have to warm up and kind of loosen up for a few minutes, you know, and then you could get him to open up. Unlike Dylan, Eric was outgoing and seemingly confident. This video shows Eric flirting with a classmate in the school cafeteria. Eric was known for his calm and deferential behavior. Eric was all, all about minimizing the damage. You know, yes sir, no sir, you know, suck up all he needed to do, say all the right things to get out of there. Eric and Dylan met in junior high and eventually became best friends. Then, during their junior year, they had a run-in with the law. January 30th, 1998. Eric and Dylan broke into a locked van and stole some electronics. They were arrested, charged with criminal trespassing and theft, and pled guilty. A judge ordered them to take part in a youth diversion program. Probation for first-time nonviolent offenders. Program counselors learned Eric had difficulty controlling his temper and required that he take anger management classes. To juvenile officers, the classes appeared to help. But in March, Randy and Judy Brown discovered that Eric had his own website. It contained a death threat against their son, Brooks. On his site, Eric wrote, All I want to do is kill as many of you as I can especially a few people like Brooks Brown. Eric also bragged that he and Dylan had been building and detonating pipe bombs. The Browns filed this report with the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. 
Two weeks later, they followed up by meeting with a detective. According to the Browns, he assured them that there was enough information to investigate Eric for his bomb-making activities. It wasn't until after the Columbine tragedy that the Browns learned police never pursued their investigation. However, according to public records, investigators did draft an affidavit, the first step in obtaining a search warrant. The draft affidavit shows that investigators suspected a connection between Eric and an unsolved pipe bomb case. It read, quote, on February 15, 1998, there was a report of a pipe bomb. The size is consistent with the devices labeled by Harris. That affidavit made it clear that the characteristics of that pipe bomb were identical to the ones he had written about on his web page. Reporter Kevin Vaughn believes that had police pursued the investigation and searched the Harris home, they might have found pipe bombs and early evidence of the plot. You have to ask yourself whether they would have found things that would have led them to have stopped Columbine from happening. But a search warrant was never obtained, and the case was eventually closed. In 2004, the Colorado Attorney General's office looked into the Browns case. They found that police believed they didn't have probable cause to pursue the search warrant. The Jefferson County Sheriff's Department declined requests for an interview with the final report. April 26th, 1998. Not long after the Browns' meeting with police, Eric's journal outlines initial plans for an attack on a high school. It was a full year before the assault on Columbine. Over the next 12 months, Eric and Dylan began gathering supplies. What was their plan? To blow up the cafeteria and shoot people as they fled. First thing to realize about Columbine, it was not intended just as a school shooting. I mean, it was intended as a bombing. Eric wrote, we will be in all black, dusters, black army pants. It'll be like the LA riots, the Oklahoma bombing, World War II, Vietnam, all mixed together. They wanted to uh, harm as many people as they could. Um, I think their plans were very grandiose and um, they were gonna take it as far as they could take it. On the day of the attack, the pair would plant bombs in the cafeteria. They'd wait by their cars for the bombs to detonate. Then they'd shoot students and teachers as they tried to escape the flames. Did they intend to commit suicide all along? Yes, based on their journal entries. They did not expect to come out of that alive. Their plan all along was to die in the incident, either from police bullets or from their, by their own hand. They had imagined this, you know, huge firefight with the cops, this war. Satisfied with their plan, Eric and Dylan set a tentative date and turned their thoughts to weapons. In his journal, Eric wrote, it will be very tricky getting all of our supplies, explosives, weaponry, ammo, and then hiding it all. During the next 11 months, Eric and Dylan began to amass an arsenal and make their final frightening video. Entry exit. <laughs> Imagine that in someone's brain. That's next, and more answers to our questions when the final report continues. Fall, 1998. Columbine High School students Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold are planning an assault on their school. They stockpile an arsenal of weapons that includes pipe bombs. Where did they get these bombs? The bombs were homemade. On a chart detailing their bomb-making efforts, Eric kept track of their progress. They made 23 bombs in the month of October. Investigators found that it wasn't hard for Eric and Dylan to make bombs. They downloaded plans from the internet and they bought materials at local hardware stores. The things that injured people here were as simple as nails and BBs in some cases. Uh, these things were made with uh, 
propane tanks and stick matches and duct tape, and they're all household items. Five months before the assault, Eric and Dylan try to purchase guns at a gun show, like this one in Denver. They are denied because of their age. A frustrated Eric writes in his journal, I have enough explosives to kill about 100 people. That just isn't enough. Guns. I need guns. On the day of the killings, the two brandish sawed-off shotguns, a rifle, and a semi-automatic handgun. How were teenagers able to get weapons like these? Older friends, unaware of the plot, provided them to Eric and Dylan. One day after their unsuccessful attempt to buy weapons, Eric and Dylan try again. This time they recruit an unwitting accomplice from school, someone old enough to legally buy guns. They return to the same gun show, and their 18-year-old friend purchases shotguns. In his journal, Eric declares it a triumph. He writes, it's all over now. This capped it off, the point of no return. Three months before the assault, Eric and Dylan also enlist the help of co-worker Phil Duran. He introduces the pair to another man, Mark Maines, who sells them a semi-automatic pistol for $500. Duran and Maines were later convicted and served time for selling a gun to minors. Once Eric and Dylan have their weapons, they overcome their biggest obstacle. Now they keep a low profile, maintain a normal routine, and attend classes. Did the teachers at Columbine notice any warning signs? Yes. An English teacher became alarmed about an essay by Dylan. February 1999. Two months after making their hitman video that went unreported by school officials, Dylan submits an essay about a man in a trench coat who goes on a shooting spree. His teacher schedules an appointment to meet with Dylan's parents. In a note to Dylan, she wrote, You are an excellent writer and storyteller, but I have some problems with this one. The teacher did contact the parents. The parents said they would address the issue, and it stopped after that. When confronted by his parents about the essay, Dylan told them it was just a story. His teacher did not report any further problems. But Eric and Dylan used the school's television production equipment again to produce a disturbing home video. This footage, recovered from Eric's home hours after the attack, helps answer the question. How do they learn to shoot with such accuracy? They practiced at a shooting range. March 1999. One month before their rampage, Eric and Dylan went to a makeshift firing range in the mountains just outside of Denver. In the video, they honed their skills by firing at trees and bowling pins. They marvel at the destruction they can cause. Entry exit. <laughs> Imagine that in someone's brain. Columbine principal Frank DeAngelis told the final report the video production teacher was unaware they had made this home video. In the following weeks, they build more bombs and finalize their plan. Then, after 12 months of preparation, they launch their assault on their target, Columbine High School. April 20th, 1999. In a 49-minute rampage, Eric and Dylan kill a dozen students, one teacher, and wound 24. After the attack, it was widely reported that the killers had a hit list of students. Did Eric and Dylan target specific students? No. Everyone was a target. Eric and Dylan expected their bombs to do most of the killing. When they didn't go off, the two fired indiscriminately. Everyone they shot was a target of opportunity. That person just happened to be literally where they were when they were shooting. One of those people who got in the way was teacher Dave Sanders, who died before he could be moved. Why did it take so long for help to arrive? SWAT teams had to secure the school room by room. When SWAT teams first entered the building, they moved toward the gunfire. But when the shooting stopped, 
they began a methodical room-by-room -room search for the gunman. When it goes quiet and it has a whole different dynamic, now we're dealing with a possible hostage situation. You couldn't just run through the building and run to the library. Police also found it difficult to navigate around the school. It wasn't just a school with a straight hallway with rooms on each side. Every room that you went into was a larger area that broke off into other areas. In the aftermath of this tragedy, questions arose about what the killer's parents knew in the months before the assault. I'm sure they spend uh, many, many hours asking the question, what did we do wrong? That's next, and answers to the last of our questions in the conclusion of The Final Report. April 20th, 1999, Columbine High School. In a 49-minute rampage, Eric Harris and Dylan Kleebold murdered 12 students, one teacher, and injured 24 before turning their guns on themselves. Afterward, victims and their families wondered how a pair of teenagers could plan this attack without their parents finding out. It raises the question, what did their parents know? It appears Eric's parents did know of some troubling behavior. What Dylan's parents knew is less clear. Since the killings, Eric and Dylan's parents have declined nearly all interview requests. For the most part, they only spoke to police through their attorneys. Through these communications, and from clues found in the evidence, it appears Eric's parents had observed some disturbing conduct. Two years before the assault, Eric's father, Wayne Harris, began a journal. In it, he documented some of Eric's behavioral problems. Eric, he wrote, is unwilling to control sleep habits and unwilling to control study habits. A 1998 entry in Eric's journal seemed to indicate that his father had confronted him about making pipe bombs. He wrote, I lie a lot. What are some big lies I have told? No, I haven't been making more bombs. I wouldn't do that. Eric's skill at, at deceiving people, at hiding the things, at hiding his own reactions helped him cover it all up. After Eric and Dylan were arrested for breaking into a van and placed on probation, Eric was sent to a psychiatrist. His doctor prescribed an antidepressant, which is typically used to treat obsessive compulsive disorder. According to Eric's parents, he took the medication regularly, but his pattern of lying continued. In May 1998, he wrote a letter of apology to the owner of the van he had broken into. He says, I'm not just sorry I got caught. I'm sorry I did it. And I understand the difference. And at the same time that he's writing that, he's writing in his journal this rant saying, why shouldn't I have the right to break into a van of some mother effer who, you know, leaves it out in the middle of nowhere? In February 1999, Eric completed the diversion program probation for first-time nonviolent offenders. The diversion officer wrote a glowing report saying that, you know, he's a bright, wonderful young man who great things were going to happen to him someday. This was about a month and a half before the massacre. As for Dylan's parents, less is known about their knowledge of their son's actions. After the shooting, Tom and Susan Klebold told police they hadn't noticed any recent unusual behavior. Only that Dylan, quote, seemed a little sadder. In the final analysis, the most difficult question remains. Why did Eric and Dylan go on their murderous rampage? They wrote extensively about how they'd carry it out, but far less about why. Even so, their own words provide clues. It seems revenge for their January 1998 arrest played a role. When Eric entered the youth diversion program, he wrote of the arrest as the most traumatic thing that ever happened to him. It was in April of 1998, they went before the judge and were put into this program. And 
Not coincidentally, I think, is April of 98 is when Eric starts his journal. And when he writes the opening line, I hate the effing world. And, and really starts, starts planning it. Later that month, in a note to Eric, Dylan also alluded to the arrest. Dylan wrote, we, the gods, will have so much fun killing enemies, blowing up stuff, killing cops. My wrath for January's incident will be godlike. Clinical psychologist and the FBI's lead investigator, Dwayne Fusilier, analyzed the writings and videos left behind by Eric and Dylan. Eric and by inclusion, Dylan were better than everyone else. Uh, truly a, uh, had a contempt for, in his own words, the entire human race. On this website, Eric described his fascination with Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection. He wrote, natural selection, damn, it's the best thing that ever happened to the earth, getting rid of all the stupid and weak organisms. Eric Harris talks in his journal about how he would like to put everybody in a super doom game and see, you know, whoever can fend for themselves and get out lives, who, whoever doesn't, doesn't. On the day of the shooting, Eric wore a white t-shirt with the words natural selection printed on the front. Dylan's black t-shirt said, wrath. Although their medical records remain sealed, there is evidence that the two suffered serious psychological problems. While Dylan ranted aloud about his alleged superiority, privately, his journal entries indicate self-loathing. In some of his writings, he's extremely elated because he's found the girl of his dreams. And then literally a month later, his next writing says, I want to die. This girl doesn't know who I am. Underneath Eric's pleasant exterior was an angry, deluded adolescent. Eric had a tremendous amount of anger, hatred, the lack of a conscience. He simply didn't care about hurting other people, wanted to hurt other people, and wanted to hurt almost everyone. In the final report, it's clear that in the year leading up to the assault, there were opportunities that could have exposed the plot to attack Columbine. But information was not fully shared between local police, the school, and the parents, and the plot went unnoticed. He had all of the different pieces of information that people had, people in the community, friends, parents, school administrators, law enforcement, had all those entities somehow gotten that information together, yes, it would have been very alarming. May 2000, the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department released their official report on the shooting. It contained a detailed timeline and nearly 10,000 pieces of evidence. The report concluded that Eric and Dylan acted without outside help. Yet some documents are still not available to the public. The unreleased material includes videotapes, known as the basement tapes, in which Eric and Dylan reportedly discuss their motives for the massacre. Officials cite the potential for copycat crimes as the reason for withholding these tapes and documents. By August 2003, the parents of Dylan and Eric settled lawsuits with nearly all the families of the slain and injured students. Both families still live in Jefferson County. The repercussions of the Columbine murders were felt nationwide. Since Columbine, more than three billion federal dollars have been allocated to improve school safety programs. Schools nationwide have adopted so-called zero tolerance policies concerning weapons and violent behavior. They have also improved crisis response plans. Despite these programs, school associated violence remains a problem. Between May 1999 and 2006, Approximately 100 students were killed in school shootings across America. In 2006 alone, in seven separate school shootings, 10 students were killed. Some survivors of Columbine made miraculous recoveries. Patrick Ireland, who was shot in the head twice, spent seven months in rehabilitation. He made a nearly full recovery and graduated as valedictorian of the class of 2000. 
I was focusing on me getting better, getting back to as strong as I could, as smart as I could, and I was able to do that. Still, that horrifying day in April of 1999 has left an indelible mark on those who experienced the massacre firsthand. And on the psyche of the American public, where the word Columbine is synonymous with school violence. Yeah, I think there's a shooting at my school. We have units on the night. Can you find any perpetrators and then let it go? No, not, not really. Like, it seems like a lot of people are here. Can you tell huh? me where you are? How uh, many people? Can you see the perpetrators? Can you see the guys with the guns? I don't know. Are you inside or outside? Hello? Shut down. Hello? 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 Can you pick up? Hello? Hello? Can you tell me where you are? Hello? Can you tell me where you are? Oh, 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 they're shooting in school. Where are you Help at? me, help me. Turn the fucking shooter, shut the fucking cops! Perpetrator has a phone. Look at the perpetrator has a phone. Did you see her fall? Oh, oh, I've fallen, oh no. I think they're dead. It really doesn't matter now. They're gonna die. There's two people. Oh, man. I'm fucking bleed to death. There's two shooters, man. One. We're such mean people. Yeah. Hello, can you pick up? It's our little buddy. How you doing, little buddy? Come on, let's go. No, hold up, hold up. I got a phone call here. Andre. Any, hold on, any last words? Come on. Andre! Perpetrator's name is Andre. Andre? Andre? Can you pick up? Hey, everybody! Hi. Several people in the room. That's funny. Captain Hill Pass, women in the room. Shot fired. Seven shot fired. Rapid fire. Shut up! Shot fired. Shot fired. Shot fired. Can you hear me, Andre? Andre, can you pick up? Yeah, look. 
It's Greg. Greg, sit down, man. Sit down. And relax. Sir, I like that. I called you, sir. I can't kill you. You're too pathetic. You're gonna live today, man. You're gonna live. Several shots. Rapid fire. <laughs>
Andre. Two. We can get you Three. out of this. Why don't you just pick up the phone? Shut fired. Perpetrators may be down. <laughs>